Hi, everyone. My apologies for being one minute late. It's absolutely my fault because we we're just having so much fun backstage. So with that, I'm just going to get right into everything. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce you to Kara Wilson Oliver. Yes, it's Kara, not Kara. So please make note of that. Get the name right. Um, I'm going to start with this. When it comes to cartography, Kara Wilson Oliver is just about as good as Buster Bluth from Arrested Development. Do not ask her to read a map. And I'm saying this not to be disparaging. I'm saying it because her career path began as a developer for a company that made maps. Kara realized that this was not exactly a good fit. Um, but being the first, but being a part of the first family in her hometown to own a computer, tech was, it, it is her life but so is civic participation and being a mother to both a teen and a tween. So I asked Kara, how do they impact the way she sees the world? Her answer began as, you know, something simple, care and seeing life in someone else's shoes. Elaborating further, Kara shared the end of her father's life. His name is Keith. And during the last years of his life, Keith lost the ability to eat and speak. And at one point, his eyes were permanently closed. So Kara had to think of creative ways for her father to enjoy what's left of life. And this translated to her focus on the human experience, parlaying that into four billion, yes, billion with a B, as in Bakari, <laughs> billion dollars for the nonprofit organizations. Now more than ever, it's important to be present as we hear from the Director of People and Culture, Cara Wilson-Oliver, and Cara can elaborate on the importance of being present. So this is your first time hearing that intro. How'd I do? How'd I do? <laughs> I think Keith would be very proud of that. Well, first off, we can't hear you. Okay. Keith would be very proud. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, okay. thank you. I appreciate it. Okay. <laughs> all right, hi everyone. Thank and you. And now the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, I just wanna start with immense gratitude for showing up. It is the end of the day. This is a long day session. Um, I'm gonna do something that's a little bit atypical compared to the things that we've seen. So let me um, just do a brief, in, a little bit of a more in-depth introduction to myself. So yes, I'm the Director of People and Culture. As Bakari mentioned, I didn't start in People and Culture. In fact, it's just been the last couple of years that I've moved over. Started as developer, spent many years, made decades um, as a product manager. And then I'm going to talk about the journey between uh, product and people and culture and the work that I was doing there. But what's important is all along, um, as Bakari mentioned, I was doing some type of tech and social good work. Um, so currently I'm at a, a small nonprofit, but we call ourselves a for impact because we'd rather be defined with what we do, which is impact rather than what we don't do, which is profit. Uh, and we're working on building a piece of technology to help miss and disinformation. So combat against that. So uh, yeah, is it amazing? I wish I could own it. Simon Sinek uh, helped me redefine that as the rather than the nonprofit, the for impact. And I think his one of his fellows is speaking after this. I'm very, very excited. I think Stephen's speaking after this. So yeah, so that's what we do. We're being, building a piece of technology. We're located in the Mars uh, Discovery District, but just to give you a bit of background to, to who I am and what I'm doing, um, that's where we are. So what we're going to talk about today is, this is sort of what was supposed to be an alluring um, topic, but, you know, talking about this potential resignation boom. Now, uh, a few of the other speakers have hinted about this today. I specifically um, did a bunch of experiments when I was both product and working in HR, um, looking at employee engagement, so studying it. So I'm going to show you my actual experiments and the results of it um, and how I believe uh, impact work can be folded into all existing organizations and how it might be able to help us deal with this huge perceived or real resignation boom that's coming up. So if I could just ask everyone to grab a piece of paper, a piece of uh, paper and a pen as we go through, we're going to do a really, really simple exercise uh, as we go through here. So just, I'm going to start at the beginning of my story, then I'm going to jump to the end, and then I'm going to finish in the middle. 
So uh, the year was 2019. And as I said, I was transitioning between product and people and culture. And I spent a year doing uh, with an experimental firm doing prototyping and solutioning, specifically looking at employee engagement, specifically in the millennial generation. Now, as someone who is not a millennial, I'm a Gen Xer, I have massive respect for the millennial generation. Um, so I was really, really curious to study them. And I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail later on why, um, why we were specifically interested in that generation in the workforce. So jumping forward to sort of the end, which is where we are today. So 2021, I just wanna spend a moment to think about, uh, cause I work in this impact space, just to think about <laughs> the huge change that we've all gone through um, and the change that is coming, right? So we see this coming out of pandemics, coming out of big wars, people's worlds become technicolor at the end. Right? And everyone either silently or verbally comes up with this thing in the back of their head and they promise themselves, let's do it right this time. Let's be the ones that get this right. So we sort of start, or we end in there. So you can start to see this in the popular media. If anyone hasn't seen this extra gum um, commercial, please go and enjoy it. It is a fantastic thing with Celine Dion um, singing behind it. Um, but what it does is, you know, we start to see these things in popular media and what it does is it reminds us that post pandemic, we start to take more risks and we demand more, right? And there are two things that actually matter in our lives when we think about impact, which is how long do you live and how well, and everything else wraps around that. So, so the doom and gloom part, right? We've, we've seen hints of this as we come along. We're starting to see this more and more in, the, in, in newspaper articles. They're now equating quitting your job with self-care, right? There's, the, there's a term that's been called the clock out here. Um, there are guides on how you can elegantly and gracefully quit your job in the, in the quote unquote great post pandemic resignation boom, right? And we might have seen uh, some cracking happen uh, with, with the base camp example in the last month. So we're starting to see a bit of a buildup. So what I wanna to talk to you guys, instead of being like, here's a whole bunch of scary stuff, <laughs> I can talk about the work, how I did pre-pandemic, might actually be able to help us uh, solve for some of this. So we're just gonna take a moment to uh, with ourselves right now. So if you just grab a, that piece of paper, Ashley, grab, draw a line right down the middle. This is nothing complicated, just a big line down the middle. On the left-hand side at the top, just write the word less. And I just wanna ask everyone just to spend a moment, whether it be funny or serious, it doesn't matter. There's no rules around this. Share them in the chat if you're willing, certainly no pressure to wanna to respect everyone's boundary. So what are the bunch of things that uh, what you just want less of? So picture yourself in that euphoric post pandemic world. And what do you want less of? So some examples, I want less television. I want less waste. I want frankly, less virtual webinars. I wanna be able to touch and hug people again. Um, the, the, the bottom one is not mine, but my friend sent it to me the other day and I had to share, which is she wants to spend less time listening to her husband chew ice cream, which is a special skill. So let's just take a moment and write down, what do you want less of? And if anyone has anything, less eating, yes, thank you. <laughs> less stress, yeah. Less time inside, yeah. Less Instagram at 11 p.m., yeah. Less TikTok, yeah. Yeah, less isolation. Yeah, less self-doubt, I love that. Less anxiety, yeah. Less masks, no one's put it yet, but let's be honest. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, so we'll just move on. So thank you. So that's just sort of like you know, picturing yourself in that post post pandemic euphoric phase. So now that we're in that zone, I just want to talk a little bit about the work I was doing. So the organization was called Better Place. I call my I call that time in my life I was an undercover millennial <laughs> as a Gen Xer. 
Um, I spent basically a year, um, you know, absorbing and listening to the millennial generation. So there were sort of four main reasons why we focused on millennials, because we had to narrow down the scope of our sort of problem definition. So number one, uh, just a vast number. So 50% of the workforce is uh, in 2021. So that's today is, a, is part of the millennial generation. It's huge, right? And 75% in 2030. So if those volume isn't enough, we've got three more reasons. I uh, specifically thought it would be interesting for me to look at. So number one, they started social good. It's embedded right off the beginning. It's in their lives from kindergarten, right? I can say as a Gen Xer, I didn't do one volunteer hour. It was not required, not part of my generation. I obviously do it now, but it wasn't part when I was when I was younger. So they, the millennial generation has grown up with the desire to do good, right? And therefore, by nature, they are the most generous generation. Number two, millennials demand that their work have impact, right? So that's amazing. Um, however, um, they're also on this pleasure versus purpose hedonistic treadmill. So hedonistic treadmill, meaning they... Uh, have to find something amazing and then you know it has to keep getting better and better and better and better and better and the output of that of that in HR is seen in the generation with the most turnover right so we've got most generous and most turnover and this one I love I loved spending my time uh, studying the millennial generation specifically because of this word maverick so this came out of one of the reports which is this generation can affect those above and below it so both Gen X, myself, and Gen Ys, or Gen Z, sorry, they will follow the millennials. So um, they can influence up and downstream from them. So those four reasons are why we thought, hey, let's, let's look very closely at millennial generations because if we can solve for the millennial generation with employee engagement, then we can solve for the others. So when we do product, we have this great saying, we say we want to make sure we fall in love with the problem, not fall in love with the solution. So being very clear about what our problem is. So this is it. Here's our problem statement. So millennial employees, they have this deep seated desire to improve their world, yet they have not found ways that resonate with them that produces the impact that they seek. So there's desire, but they have not found a way in their work to produce that impact, right? So employee engagement, we're all here talking about this today. I mean, it seems like a fantastic solution, right? Look at some of these numbers. Uh, six and a half days, less of, uh, less of work missed per year, 50% increase in revenue, sign me up. Let's do employee engagement, right? What we're finding, though, is the employee engagement for, let's say, my generation, the boomer generation, is not the same as for the millennial generation. Great. So how's it going? Now, coming from an experimental mindset and, and background, I look at some of these numbers with a bit of distrust, a bit of, <laughs> bit of uh, fake news around them in some ways. But if you look at some of these numbers, they say 85% were disengaged, definition vague, but disengaged pre-pandemic. That number is looking to be higher, 93%, right? Some of the language around it is, I'm more interested in some of the qualitative than the quantitative work and some of the things that we're starting to see trending. And we do this work at Digital Public Square where I work now. Um, corporate livestock, right? Death by overwork. And I have to ask myself the question, when I look at the millennial generation, they, the elders are getting to be mid-career. And I can even speak for this myself. Mid-career is where you, you just naturally do a reassessment. So do we just have an even enormous wave, the end of the pandemic, the midlife for the elder millennials, this deep desire that has, that has become, that is, is, has shown itself as disengagement? You know, does this resonate? Does this resonate with anyone here? So there's really four things that um, through all of the interviews and all the work I did that I knew wasn't working. So we went and talked to big corporations, small startups. We were Canadian based um, and we were focused on millennials, but as we know, there was a lot of them. But we came up with four things and, and I hope this sort of lands with you guys. So number one, engagement can't be filled by things. And thank God, like again, we, we discovered these sort of pre-pandemic, but the pandemic uh, taught us that your bee bank chairs and your beer fridges, that doesn't drive engagement. We know that and we just proved it again, right? So the number two thing is that your organization mission rarely, 
rarely drives long-term engagement. So just to take a breath on that, some, if you work in mission-based work, hopefully that isn't true. Um, for those of us that have that, we kind of rely on that as a crutch. We have all kinds of other problems that we need to deal with. But that long-term mission for non, sorry, that, lo the, for, that long-term engagement doesn't come from, from your organization if it isn't mission-based. It just isn't there. Top-down CSR, uh, corporate social responsibility. So top-down where the decision made, it just happens to be conveniently linked to the thing that your business does. Interesting, valuable, but it's limiting and it's especially limiting within the millennial generation. And the second, or the fourth thing is around vanity metrics versus uh, impact metrics. So this is an important point. Vanity metrics, and we are very careful about this when uh, those of us that work in the tech plus social good space, a vanity metric would be number of people who showed up, right? There's 28 people in the session, amazing. That's a great number, that's interesting kind of a vanity metric in a sense that what I'm more interested in is how many people are actually engaged in what's going on? How many people will learn something from this and move it forward in their life? That's not going to be 28. That's going to be a subset of that. But that's the number that, that I should be looking at, right? So always looking at vanity, uh, making sure that you're not looking at vanity metrics, but rather focusing on impact metrics as we go through. All right, so then, then we're coming to the solution. So we're like, well, what might work? We were interested in how non-mission-based organizations, so for-profit organizations generally to do broad strokes, could engage in authentic social impact work for these fabulous maverick millennials. That's what we're looking at. How can we bring that forward? So over the year, we ran a whole series of experiments. Some of them got really wild and crazy. I was walking the streets of Toronto, talking to people who were outside of workplaces. Um, you know, we ran a whole bunch of social media ads. We looked at general population. We did all kinds of things. But ultimately, where it summed up to is we were looking at, will employees engage in social, socially uh, positive acts, and does it improve their engagement at work? So I will not lie. <laughs> We did not think this would work. The CEO um, and I uh, were just like, we tried every which way to prove ourselves wrong. Um, and just to give you an idea, some of these, some of the things we're asking people for about four minutes of their time. And we were very clear up front, this is not a real product. This is, there's no real, pro there's no reward at the end. We were up front. We're like, you are doing this for the good of the good, right? And uh, you know, usually you get people to drop off when you ask them to do things like this. Um, we had built, we were asking them to do these things. We built these things called impact packages. And what's really important, we came up with a whole just creative thinking between 10 minutes to five hours. We knew it, we didn't need to be a really, really long engagement, but these impact packages, these things, these actions to do needed to be something that were not linked to a charity. So they're not volunteering. So I don't know who here has, remember in the old days when you're like, let's all go volunteer. Let's do VTO, volunteer time off. Let's go spend time together um, uh, doing something. And there's really like, you know, everyone wants to go to the SPCA, but they can't handle it. Um, and so you end up either cleaning up a park or going and doing uh, food, food sorting distribution in uh, like the Daily Bread Food Bank or something, which is wonderful. I absolutely, all of that is needed. But there's a desire and a need for something that's smaller and that the charity doesn't need to organize. They are not set up to handle um, managing employees coming in for a short term work to do, you know, a day of volunteer. But rather, are there is there something in between? And so that was the space we were looking at. You can see we came up with wild and crazy ideas like send packages to the elderly, uh, just show up at charitable events that you don't know anyone and just cheer the people who are doing the work that are fundraising and, and participating in the event, all kinds of things. And so again, we expected to fail, but here's what we actually saw. 48%, so about half of the people with no prompts at the end, it wasn't even a real product. They did, they committed to the action. They either committed to it wholeheartedly or they gave us a really strong proxy for commitment. And what's very important is 95% of them immediately did a second action. It, it was that powerful. So we knew we were onto something. So there are three sort of things I just wanna talk, talk through here. We learned that the most valuable thing to give is time. They wanna give time. 66% wanna give time, a sprinkling wanna give money, and there was you know, a sort of few outliers. 
So time is the most valuable thing to give. We ran this campaign called Walking with George. <laughs> so we put up a picture of an elderly gentleman from the back sitting on a park bench. And we went out, we went to general population gen pop, we asked employers, we asked employees, we did everything out there. And we basically put in this campaign that says, George needs uh, someone to help him get his groceries. And I want to remember, this was pre-pandemic where it was a little less risky for George, but he would, we, we went out and said, would you help George? And not only would you help George, so we, we built in proxies for commitment. We built in things like, would you pay for George, like to walk George, right? Like how deep does your commitment go to that? 92% on average across all the populations we looked at wanted to help George. He was local, he was in need, and it was, it was a, a, a relationship that um, both sides could learn from. George was talkative, he wanted to share his stories, you know, these types of things. So we got 92% of people wanted to do something around that and 80% committed to what we call a proxy for commitment, which is basically they said, you know, not only do I want to work, George, and I commit the time, I'd actually pay the service to do that. Outstanding results. And here's the last sort of major, major thing that we learned, which is, did you get satisfying impact? Because I was worried. I was like, is that just like an afterglow after a moment of interaction or does this have some long term? So between long term and sort of short to medium term, 71% felt like the actions that they were doing, those impact packages that we did, meant something to them. It meant something to them because their employer provided it to them and they felt that the work that they had done was satisfying and impactful. So we're just gonna take a moment, we're gonna finish your um, list. So you know how we had the left, the left side of the paper, um, which said less, on the right hand side of the paper, I want you to write what you want more of. So picture yourself back in that euphoric space, right? You get to hug your parents for the first time. You know, even I'm getting emotional talking about it. What are the things that you want more of coming out of this? And it might be more money or more responsibility or, you know, more kids. Who knows, right? Um, yeah, more connection, more laughter, more live music, more creating, more purpose. What are these things? More time, more meaning, more life. I love that. I love that. I just think it's important that we do more travel. Exactly. Oh my God. I've already told my husband this morning, like, we're retiring in um, Paris. Just FYI. <laughs> that's, that's my big result coming out of this. More fun. Absolutely more free time, more time that's free. Yeah, I get that. More fun, that's lovely. Those are great. Amazing, so yeah, so more, 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 more. Amazing, thank you for sharing, very grateful. So to, to just sort of more hugs, yeah, more restaurant dining, more trip, more travel, that's, that's wonderful, thank you. So there were really sort of four main points that I want to drive home. And then I'm going to give you guys some practical examples of ways you can actually implement these. So what we learned coming out of these experiments are four key things. So number one, impact can be found through small acts, right? Small acts. The acts do not need to be oversized. They just need to be human. So that's really important and powerful. And again, the millennial generation taught me that. They don't need to be oversized. They don't need to change the world in this grand scale. Thank God they can be their right size and there's something that are more doable around that. So that's number one. Number two, as we talked about giving, giving time, work time specifically is preferred, <laughs> right? They wanna give their time. It, it feels like the most valuable thing to give and they want the experience versus the, you know, a, a donation into a generalized fund. Number three, no surprise here, autonomy and individualism. So they want to be able to have control over it and they want it to be custom to them, right? That's what the employees are looking for. They're looking for curated actions a la carte. They want to self-identify and self-form around these acts. And the fourth thing is that, as we mentioned, it really does boost engagement, right? We saw, and this is the term that we, we ended up uh, coining around this, that employees were mobilized. They were mobilized around impact within their workplace. And it's interesting how that can sort of um, filter through. And I'm gonna talk about a few examples. Remember I talked about that hedonistic treadmill? 
which is really a, 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 a dopamine, right? You get a ding on your phone, you get, a, you get your dopamine spikes, it's a feel good, it's a pleasure sensation, and you keep running on that treadmill. You need more and more and more and more. What we were specifically looking at is replacing that dopamine hit with an oxytocin hit. And the reason why um, is that is the, the hormone that's released when you find purpose uh, or social trust. So those are the things that we're looking to transition to. So when you think about ways to possibly in integrate this into your, um, your community, you want to look at things that, that aren't a dopamine hit, but rather that, that are an oxytocin. Okay, so I should have started with a spoiler alert. So better place as an organization as on hold. When we think about problems in product, we talk about gravity and anchor problems as being really heavy problems. So meaning things that weigh you down or things you have to design around. In-person impact packages, not great in the, um, in the, in the pandemic world. However, the team that, that um, worked on Better Place moved over and worked uh, on Digital Public Square. So we are, uh, as an entity, working on mis and disinformation. So we found a fantastic home, which is wonderful. But I don't want to leave you guys without some practical examples. So some immediate solutions of things that you can do. I just want to do a shout out to the image on the right hand side of the screen. I found this so fascinating. I've been thinking about ways to celebrate when we all are back in the office and our first all hands meeting. And I saw this collaborative piece of art that I thought was so interesting where you literally just go up and, and you write your name uh, at, your, at your, the height of your head. And so imagine you go back into a wall and it's almost like the stamp of we made it, right? We made it back into the office, whatever that looks like, hybrid, et cetera. Um, but there's sort of like this, this collaborative art about coming back in together and just recognizing it with simply putting your name. So I love that. But anyways, to me, that would be an oxytocin hit. Okay, so I've got four examples ranging from simple and free um, to something that, that has um, a, bit of, um, a bit of money behind it. So there's this act of kindness calendar that exists. So, so some lovely organization, randomactsofkindness.org, um, they have put a, to gallic, a calendar every single day has an idea about how you get that oxytocin hit or how you could uh, encourage someone else to get that. It's free, you can download it, it's really, really simple. And the ideas are, are, um, are pretty easy to implement. Anyone who has gone into the subscription service and done things like uh, WF Homey or Work From Homey, they, organizations like this, so they're ones that like will send out care packages, um, they'll do wellness, med uh, meditation, thing, they'll do all these great packages they put together. They're also opening up their mind to this idea around these impact packages. So if you already have a su subscription service, um, I would, you know, encourage uh, whatever provider you're using to also consider something that has that oxytocin hit. And again, I don't know what the budget would be variable based on what you have now, but I can specifically say that um, uh, WF Homey, they are actively looking at this. And I think that's fantastic. So the next one, I use this within my organization, even though we're a mission based org, we also like to make sure that the 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 um, team events that we have are related to compassion and empathy to make sure that we always keep that, that skill sharp. So Airbnb, this is available to everyone. This is what I love about it. They have these social impact experiences. So it's all online. Um, and what I love about it is the person comes on and they're teaching you about something uh, that's important to them. So we have um, had one where we had two fellows who were who were deaf come on and they taught us uh, sign language. And it was great because the first 20 minutes were in complete silence while well, one signed and one typed. And then they taught us the Fresh Prince of Bel Air theme song, <laughs> right? Um, you know, and what's so great is that it starts to build those compassion and empathetic muscles. Uh, it's on average about 30 bucks an employee. It's pretty low uh, and it's an hour. And I guarantee you people will come out of that and think that is an hour well spent. The one image I have on here is uh, they have a Paralympic um, uh, category. So this fellow here, he was a Paralympic. He won a whole bunch of uh, swimming medals for Britain. And then he became a carpenter. He is missing his uh, right forearm. And so he teaches you how he uses his prosthetics in a creative way. Amazing team building exercise, highly recommend it. My last one here, anyone in the GTA, I would highly recommend that you look at Troop. Hi, Bakari. I'm just on my very, very last slide here. 
I recommend that you look at this organization named Troop. Um, it's hightroop.com. What they're doing is they are, they go out and they work and they partner with charities and they come up with tangible needs specific for people that the charity services. So they're creating that one-to-one -one relationship. So, um, you know, they'll go out and they'll say that there's a teenage mom, that's the one every week they put out a new one. There's a teenage mom this week who needs help with um, getting a bassinet and they'll basically crowdsource, uh, wait, they'll crowdsource um, over the week to, to fund that particular one. She has created one for employers. Same type of thing. She will go out and she will find actual needs of real people and then she'll get a curated list. She'll, uh, she has the whole tech, your employees vote on it. The top one gets funded and then you get a monthly impact reports and pictures. Um, and here's what's important, the buy-ins minimum. So the employer pays it and it's basically just directed donations, but it comes with real story and real impact. Her minimum is you can start with $75 a month for the entire organization and you can go up from there. So I'd highly recommend it. If you're in the GTA, reach out to Kelly at hightroop.com. Um, I can't recommend her enough. She's, she's great. And so I've got my last one. So I just want to say with enormous gratitude, thank you so much for joining and sticking with me at the end of this day. Um, until we can meet in person, please stay safe. And uh, I'll just sort of say my one last more is, is to make it to Ireland. My trip got canceled right uh, in the pandemic. It was a trip of a lifetime taking the kids, my cousins, my mother who were up there. And uh, so I want more Ireland. <laughs> Cara, thank you so much. You're welcome. So this is the time for our q and I encourage everyone to start putting those um, in the Q&A section. If you want to come on stage, raise your hand, let us know. Um, Cara, if I may, I would love to kick everything off with the with kind of a personal question. Um, sure. for Is that okay? Yeah. So Andrea mentioned more free time. Um, you know, people mentioned travel and all of these other things. Mm. All of this revolves around time, which when I was in my 20s and you know, it was working just kind of the, the corporate job just because I wanted money and I hated it um, at one point. And I just remember going to my boss and just kind of complaining and you know, he was saying, no, you know, you're good at this. You need to keep doing it. Think about what you're doing as, you know, giving these people you're consulting with more time to do whatever. And then it became apparent to me that, you know, time is the greatest commodity that we have. And you and I sort of talk about this a little bit, and it's kind of uh, revolving around, you know, legacy, being present, um, how you were creative with your father and making sure, seeing how he can have the best time of his remaining years. How does this all come together with impact? and what you're doing? Yeah, great question. Uh, way, way to keep it light. <laughs> <laughs> Super easy. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's a really great question. I think what it does, that experience that I had, specifically my father, so just to give people a little bit more context, I spent my 20s looking after a father who had a really rare neurodegenerative disease, that of which there was really zero solutions. So we dealt with it with, with humor. It was an absolutely terrifying disease that he had to go through, um, but we did our absolute best. And I think the 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 what what came out of that is my inability for patience around things inability to not do things that are worthwhile right i've used this term over and over and over in my professional career which is basically i want to do work worth doing right and i won't settle for anything else and that has taken me on a whole journey of things um, uh, professionally, as you can see, I've sort of floated around, but what's been core to it is this work worth doing. So I think that's really what came out of it is really an understanding of a true understanding of what, uh, how short life is and how 
you know, my my impact doesn't need to be oversized. It, it frankly doesn't, but it needs to be meaningful to me. And I think when I started to see those results come out of my experiments with the millennial generation, I felt like I was part of it. I felt like I was I could really understand that and really help to solve it. So those are sort and of the connections that I come that come out of it. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that. On that note, mm -hmm. Christopher Martinez has a question. I'm going to read it. Hey, Cara, thank you. Any insights into the impact that Gen Z might have on millennials? <laughs> I know. Now there's a generation war, right? Now there's a generation war. So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, Gen Z is just coming up and into the, the workplace in, in a more significant way. Um, I think every generation, <laughs> I, I, I wish I had direct experiment uh, to, to, to speak to that. I did specifically focus on millennial because like I said, there's four <clears throat> reasons, including the sheer, the sheer volume. I am not a Gen Z expert um, in terms of ways that they can sort of infiltrate and, and, and affect sort of generations up and down. So I will definitely be respectful of, of, of staying out of that realm. Um, but what I will say is that uh, uh, we're starting to see that stuff trickle in. I can tell you from, from an HR perspective and people in culture, um, and this was remarked on in one of my sort of weekly sessions that I have with a valued, valued colleague, Andrea, who's on this. Um, you know, we're talking about the, the shift in conversations, right? When we're recruiting now, so many conversations now are like, so what are you doing for the community? Right, and this is for organizations that are 20 people. Right? So, the, you know, the Gen Zs are coming out and those are their criteria. Um, so they're actually asking for that upfront. It's now just assumed. So I think that type of um, mentality will carry through up and down generations. And as someone who's raising people in the next generation under Gen, Gen Z, Jenny, um, you know, I, I can't wait to see the work they do. It's going to be incredible, um, but you know I think there's also a lot of responsibility, so we need to balance that. And as someone who grew up as a Gen Xer, the laziest of the generations, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, it's an interesting balance that we have to to figure out um, because you know they are deeply, deeply, deeply concerned about climate change to the point where they're losing sleep. Yeah, so we need to balance that, um, you know, the solution, but also help them figure out how to solve the problem. Yeah. It looks like we have one more question from Sarah Skelding. As a millennial, I really relate to the notion of seeking purpose in my work. Yeah. If a potential solution or small moments of impact is this long-term preventing the post-pandemic resignation boom. Okay, and so also you, Christopher Martinez says, I'm a millennial, LOL, just curious. <laughs> <laughs> so can, can you just sum that up for me basically? So will, will impact solve for the, help to solve for the resignation boom? Is that the question? I think so, let's see if- uh, Oh here, I, should, I can flip to it. Oh yeah, she said yes, yeah, she said yes. Oh, perfect, okay, good. That's the theory. So the theory is the work that I was doing in 2019, which was all leading us towards you know, balancing pleasure and purpose. Everyone needs their individual definition of how they balance pleasure and purpose, right? That is becoming more and more of a demand now. So if we as organizations can be mindful of that as we start to do all the post-pandemic work that we have to do, potentially reopening offices, figuring out a long-term distributed workforce plan, anything that comes with that, if we could also not to layer on too much to your plate, but if you can bake in these impact moments, um, again, that sort of, it could be that 10 minute range, that sort of, you know, under five hour range, then yes, I do believe employees will notice that because they're going to come out of this pandemic and take risks, demand change. But if they start to be like the place I'm working, well, it doesn't have a mission necessarily to make the world that much of a greater place but they care about me and they're going to give me time to express myself and make impact in my, my definition of my world. And they support me in that. Yes, I do believe that will, that will increase their engagement. 
um, and make them understand that you as an organization care about them and care about what they care about. Hey, Carl, we are almost out of time, but let's squeeze in this last question from Gareth okay. Post. Any ideas for engagement and community involvement for a manufacturing workforce who may not have access to the same technology, time, transportation? Yeah. You know, the thing that jumps to my head is we ran this um, sort of semi, again, this was an experiment, so it was a theoretical experiment. We did it in a call center. So we were interested, because call center is the highest turnover, right? Uh, low bar to entry, highest turnover, um, low, highest dissatisfaction generally. So what we did was we ran an experiment and said, would your, how would your turnover be affected if you gave everyone and the stats, we went extreme because we we're running experiment, 20% of their time, so it's a day off a week to do VTO volunteer time off. Their definition in their community, not associated with the organization. And what we saw was that turnover would decrease by 50%. So if you gave people the space to define and do the work that they need to do outside of it, um, on a regular committed basis that their turnover um, would decrease enormously. So there might be something in and around that. What I want to just make sure I want to hit home is autonomy. So meaning they control it and they define it. That's what's so key in this. Um, uh, that's what's that was what, what we found key in this in our impact pass, impact packages being successful. A la carte self uh, self identification and self defined. Cool, Cara. Thank you so much. We have to end no this problem. session because I got to jam over to the next one. Thank you, All thank right. you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Massive appreciations for showing up. Appreciate it. Bye.